My name is Kathy Montag from Worthington, Ohio, graduate of The Ohio State University. Um, again, like I said, 20 years ago, if anybody would have told me that I was going to be doing this, I would have probably laughed at them. My, the trajectory I had in my head 20 years ago to what it is now is completely different. Um, my, I have three children, two adult boys, uh, 25 and 22. And Abby, who's here, who was Madonna last night, with big lucky stars hanging from her ears, who's 17. She's starting her senior year of high school this year. Um, she was diagnosed prenatally, which to me, I was always very thankful for. This is my all-time favorite picture of Abby Montag. This was the very first day of preschool after she had been, well, we joke with her, we tell her she was kicked out of the first school she ever went to, but when a typical preschool was an epic fail, which it was, uh, we had her identified at, at the preschool level and she went to a special needs preschool in Worthington where we go, where, where, where we live. Um, they had to strap her in, as you see. Her little door of the Explorer shoes barely cleared the end of that seat. That's my husband there. And we sat, we had promised the preschool we would not follow the bus. We would not peek through the windows. We were gonna leave this to them and it was probably one of the hardest things we ever had to do. Sean got off the bus, we hung on to each other and we were pretty sure we were never gonna see her alive again. I mean, that's what was going through her head when she got on this bus. It was like, oh, there she goes. Oh my God, what have we done? A stranger is driving her to school. Well, anyway, this was her in high school. She made it home that day, and she kept making it home, and she kept having success. That's her with her little boyfriend. This is them recently. They morphed over the, he's a little, just a tiny bit taller than she is. Um, the best success I can say of, of, of everything that we have done with Abby. She's a self-advocate. She is not afraid to ask for help. She is not embarrassed that she needs help. And because of that, ta-da, here she is. Oh, I have a pointer. Here she is in the front row, of course. She was so, okay, she points out that taller than her, taller than her. When she actually was you know, up alphabetically, she was like four rows up. And of course, the first thing they did for the picture was bring her down to the front. She was like, oh, bananas, I have to stand in the front. Anyway, great moment. And again, one of those moments that I'm not sure if anybody would have ever told me that this was happening, I would have believed them. But it can happen. Okay, so we're talking about transitioning to middle school and high school, which is a big, giant leap especially from an elementary school setting where they may, even, if, even if a fourth, fifth, sixth grade um, switches classrooms for English or math or science, you, you're really talking about three core teachers, maybe a couple of, of specials, but not even specials every day. It's just a whole new world when they go to middle school and high school. So before that happens, in the spring, say, you want to talk about Trans you want to have transition meetings. Even if your uh, daughter isn't on a 504 or an IEP, you want to call that school, you want to get some people together, you want to let them know, you know what she needs or the things that she might struggle with because of the Turner Syndrome or whether it's anxiety or executive functioning or whatever it is. If you think she's going to need a little extra support, then start talking early. Ask them for a transition meeting. Um, Meet the counselor. Maybe this is the spring before she's going. Go talk to the principal. They're happy to talk to you. They love having parents come in and make that effort to put a name to a face and really that, that's showing them that you care about your daughter and, and how her education is gonna go. You wanna call and meet the administrators before open house or orientation, because let me tell you, open house, as, and many of you have probably been through this if you're going from middle school to high school, it's a circus. Everybody wants to talk to the principal, everybody wants to talk to the teachers. There's you know a million little cherubs running around like they haven't seen each other in you know, years, and 
it's a, it's a very chaotic, <laughs> much like this weekend, it's a very chaotic situation. So you really want to have those conversations before that big crowd and all that energy and adrenaline is happening. You want to always keep an open dialogue between you and the school, between the school and you, back to you, between them and, and your daughter, between your daughter and them. Every line of communication really needs to stay open. I say, and I should back up, teacher to teacher summaries. I talk about that, that it, you know, not all of the information that goes back and forth needs to have you involved. I've always encouraged Abby's teachers from one year to communicate professional to professional with her teachers that she's having the next year because they will have different conversations about strategies that worked in the classroom and and as long and I'm not saying don't have any conversations with them but sometimes that's appropriate for professionals to have those conversations together and also with you at a separate time Find your allies, always take a team approach, and you guys are tired of hearing me saying this if this isn't your first time listening to me talk, but always, always, always take a team approach. You want to build relationships from the very beginning. Um, this assume positive intent is something that's always, always, always in the front of my mind, and you want to say it out loud. You want to make the statement it's, all, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You want to intentionally say, I appreciate that you always assume positive intent on my end, and I want you to know that I will always assume pos positive intent on your end. Um, and when you, a lot of times when you make a statement like that, you're really setting a tone and, and you're kind of, you know, planting the seed, so to say. I, I say this, I say it nicely on the screen, People pursue a career in education because they care about kids. So you have to remember that no matter what issues you're having with a teacher or how long they've been teaching, and maybe they're close to you know, not wanting to teach anymore, maybe they've had a rough year, but at the core, I, I always say I know no teachers who got into education to crush the souls of children, nobody. They want to be there. They've not done it for the money. They certainly have not done it for the glory. They're doing it because they care about kids and they care about education. So remember that at the core, regardless of what situation you're having with a teacher, they really do want to do what's right. They want to do the best thing. So before school also, I call it taking inventory. What worked in the last school and what didn't work. And don't be afraid to abandon things that didn't work because they didn't work. You have to really be honest about this. What worked, what didn't. Um, and I talked about this yesterday too. Be honest about strengths and weaknesses, and that's hard to do. It's easy to be honest about strengths. It's not so easy to, to really not be emotional, I should say, about weaknesses. But if you, if you recognize weaknesses or deficits, and you use strengths to overcome those weaknesses, then they won't be a forever weakness. And this is something I really, really pound home with Abby, that I'm not saying you're never going to be able to do this. I'm saying let's recognize this is an area that you need a little bit of work, probably need a little support, or some coaching, or some modeling, and the goal is that this won't be a weakness by the time you get out of school that you won't need support forever, but we've got to get there. You have to meet them where they are and bring them to where they need to be. And again, work together to create a framework for success. So you're, you're talking about your principal, your counselor, possibly your school nurse, the teachers, teaching aides, if that's the case. You want to eliminate any as many unknowns as possible. So if you're going into a middle school, say from an elementary school, Call that school up. They're there all summer. Somebody, sorry about that. I, I didn't follow the number one rule, turn cell phones to silent. Um, somebody will be there all summer. It might just be the principal. I know in Worthington, the principals are there all summer in the middle schools, but even the secretaries aren't there all summer. But there's always a principal there, and that is when you want to get that person's ear in the summer. They're way more relaxed. You know, they're not running from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. Call them early, ask them what a good time would be in for you to come and just have a conversation, and bring your daughter in to tour the building. And in most cases, they will be thrilled to open that door for you. 
They'll be all over her. They will recognize her on that first day of school. They'll remember that interaction as being a positive one. You want her to tour the buildings, especially lockers, hallways. Again, going from an elementary school to a middle school or a middle school even to a high school, everything just gets bigger. And the kids get bigger. And we all know that our girls really aren't going to get much bigger. So everything just seems very daunting and overwhelming. So if you can kind of ease her in when no one else is in the building, do it. If she's got a friend that you can take, take a friend. You want to go over her schedule. I've always modified the schedule to what makes sense to her. What makes sense to one person isn't always going to make sense to the other person. So, for instance, this was Abby's middle school schedule. They had like red days and blue days, and they didn't have the same class every day. This is, this doesn't look anything like the schedule that she received from the school. I mean, it's just a list anymore. They're so, um, they're, they're all electronically generated, so it's kind of like a list of things, and you've got the, the course number, and you have the teacher, and you have the, the the classroom, I took out of her schedule the very minimum of what she needed. She needed to know what period it was, where she was going, and on what day she was going there. So rather than give her, okay, Abby, on red days you're going to do this, and on blue days you're going to do this, we mapped out her weeks, red and blue, printed it off. She had it, we, we got her a binder that had a clear cover on it. That went right in it, and she was able to find her way pretty easily, and it was an easy thing for other people to look at and, and help her get to where she needed to go. Whoops. Okay, so if you are on an IEP or 504 or behavior plan, you want to reevaluate that plan when you're moving settings, because something that's appropriate for one school setting may not translate to a bigger or different school setting. So you want to eat, meet early. You don't want to, well, you could eat, I guess, when you meet with the, with the players early. You want to meet early with new players, meaning new teachers, new administrators, maybe a counselor. You always want to include your current team on that. I like to do it in the spring. Spring is very hectic, but if you, if you ask early and say, I just really think this would be a good idea, they're going to appreciate it. A, a middle school teacher is going to appreciate you taking the time to try to kind of get a few people at a table, even if it's not everybody, so that they can hear from you and her previous teachers and, and previous counselors, and you'll be surprised at how willing they are to do this because nobody really wants to do anything the hardest way possible. This makes things much easier. You need to make adjustments that are appropriate. So, you know, in middle school, Abby had an accommodation on her IEP that said something about the cards room and, you know, this time of day with this teacher. Well, clearly the cards room didn't exist when she got to high school and that teacher didn't exist when she got to high school. So you want to make sure that you're asking the high school, what of, you know, what are the things that are on our plan and kind of our strategies that you don't think will be effective in the high school and how can we kind of meet that need in a different way. And they'll have all sorts of ideas. Make sure your daughter is included in all discussions and is comfortable with her accommodations. Starting in middle school, this is super important because at some point, and I think I have this next, she's gonna reach the age of majority, which is 18. And you, if she's not on board with her plan and her strategies, if she's on an IEP or even a 504, at 18, she has the legal right to write herself straight off of it. So you want her involved, buying in. You, we always want to be accentuating the things that her accommodations are helping her with and how those are helping her be successful. You always want to, you know, if you're looking at your accommodations and she's kind of graduated from a few, you don't need that anymore, let's go ahead and take that out of your plan. You know, that's a celebration, that's a victory. You used to need that, we worked on it, we gave you tools, you overcame it, comes off the list. Make her feel good about getting the tools and getting the, the help that she needs. Make sure there's a safety net in place before you need it because, again, I mean, I'm going to just assume that all of us kind of have some common, um, you know, things that we can say about our kids and, and when, they, when they fall apart. And I know that with Abby, she, she's not always as transparent when she's building up 
to her big breakdown to maybe other people. So by the time she is really off the ledge, it's too late to really effectively bring her back. So you want to make sure that if, she's, if she is going to struggle, that she knows what to do and who to ask. That might be a nurse. It could be a plan that she has a card that she holds up, like she's, you know, she's really starting to stress. She needs to walk away. She needs a sensory break. Maybe it's just walking one loop around the hallway. Perhaps it's talking to a counselor or a nurse or an administrator. Um, but you want to make sure that you find somebody that she's comfortable with, who she knows before school starts. They know her. They know that they're part of the plan. That's key. And then that way, if she's starting to feel anxious or she's starting to feel overwhelmed, she can say, can I go talk to Mrs. Smith? And everybody will know that that means she, she's needing a, a break. So this could be pretty much anybody. I actually work in a student services office and I'm a, a building testing coordinator, which doesn't make me the most popular person <laughs> in the building during testing time. But I happen to be a place, it's just a safe place to fall. And kids know if they want to come eat lunch with me, I have an extra table set up for that. I've got a snack drawer, you know, who doesn't like snacks? So there's so many people in buildings that are willing to be that safe place to fall. It doesn't have to be a teacher or a, a counselor. You want to talk about the signs of distress and develop some keywords. So you want to let, you want to have, and again, involve your daughter in that conversation. How do you start to feel? Like, how do you know that you're starting to feel uncomfortable or you're starting to feel like maybe you're not keeping up or you're getting overwhelmed? And she might say one thing and her teacher might say, you know, I can start to see your foot go. Like all of a sudden she is, or she starts to talk, 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 talk. You want to talk about that, having everybody, including your daughter, you know, sort of hash out what everybody sees when she starts to ramp up a little bit. And then maybe it's a, just a code phrase, like, can I see the principal? Can I, you know, use the restroom or, you know, whatever it is. I know even at the high school level for us, we have like red cards, not getting kicked out of a soccer game, but, and, a, and, if it's on the desk and the kid pulls it out or just lays it on their desk before they leave, there's plans in place that they know. Now the thing with, I don't have it on here, the thing with those types of plans is that, they, that your student also has to know that these are the acceptable places to go. You can't throw a red card out on a desk and then leave the building because you were stressed. You know, you can go to the nurse's office, you can go to the main office, you can go to a resource room, you know, you have a list of places that are acceptable and you hold her to, you know, you, you make her accountable for that because she's part of this. Okay, so after school starts, you have to expect the unexpected because you can walk the school over and over and over again, which I totally, totally encourage. But as soon as that first day comes and 1,700 kids walk through that door, everything looks different. Everything looks different. And I know at least for Abby, you know, everybody's big. So, you know, when she was touring the building alone, she could see everything at her eye level. When that flood of teenagers comes flying through, it's a little bit more overwhelming. It's crowded. It's, you know, there's some unstructured times. We all know that peer-to-peer -peer relationships are, you know, they start from day one and they can be positive and sometimes they can be not so positive. Teacher and student relationships, not every teacher she has is gonna be her favorite teacher ever. And that's okay. And there's lessons in that too, how to deal with somebody that you might not click with so well because that's going to happen in your life. You're, you're not going to love everybody you work with. Hallways are tough. And it's something that you want to talk to your school about, especially because of the size and the anxiety and all those, you know, the sensory issues, visual, spatial. You want to talk to them about that because it might be that you might, you might want to request that she leaves a minute early and maybe gets ahead of the crowd or it's okay if it takes her a little bit extra time. You know, kids get all hung up on tardies because, you know, in most schools there's consequences for tardies. So you want to have those conversations about if she's having trouble getting from point A to point B, 
in that amount of time. Let's talk about why and what we can do to kind of help this out because she does need to be accountable for following the rules. But then there's this other piece that's sort of impeding that from happening. So hallways are tough. The B word in this case is bully. And this is a really touchy subject and it's a very, you know, publicized subject and bullying is terrible and, and we know it happens on a national level and I've never known a school to not take it seriously because they have to. And there are specific legal definitions of bullying. It's repeated, it's, it's purposeful, it's intentional, it's, it's intent is to harm. So if things are happening and you know someone is not being so nice to your daughter, you really kind of have to step back a minute before you start throwing around the word bully because they hear it all the time. And I know in Ohio, we're, we're required to then investigate the incident and send letters home to everybody involved and, and there's been a bullying incident reported and all of that, which is all, it, it's necessary and it does help the bullying situation. But somebody who maybe just isn't quite nice doesn't necessarily mean they're a bully. It means they're just not a nice kid. And I know with Abby, from the time she was little, we used to tell her, you know what? You are not in control of what other people say, do, or think. So you can't get hung up on somebody who says, I don't want to sit with you, or I don't like that shirt, or why is your hair like that? Okay. And you know, if you teach them early to let that stuff, those just mean but not necessarily harmful comments, you teach them to let those roll off her shoulders. And by the time Abby got to high school, I'm gonna say it's, it, it can sound negative. I tell people she does not care what anyone thinks of her. And I don't mean that in a negative way like I don't care what anybody thinks. If somebody doesn't like her, she moves on. It, we have really gotten to the point where I know that at some level it probably bothers her a little bit but she's gotten over it, she'll move on. She has enough people that are nice to her and supportive that don't waste your time with people who you don't get along with, you're not going to get along with everybody. And anyone, including our daughters, who say they like everybody, nobody likes everybody. I mean, there's, there's dynamics there. So the, be, just be really careful with this, this word. Use it when it needs to be used because it will be taken seriously and it needs to be taken seriously. Okay, self-advocacy, number one thing you should have in your mind going into middle school and high school because you know, middle school prepares you for high school, high school prepares you for life, whether that's college life, work life, whatever it is. So you don't want to turn around, have your daughter graduate from high school and not be able to order a pizza. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you want them to be able to do things on their own and not feel self-conscious about talking to people they don't know, for instance, or talking about something that might not be super comfortable for them. So you want to empower her to reach out to the people that are there for her when she needs support. The try three before me was always a rule that my husband and I had with the boys before Abby was born. And so we thought, you know, why rework the wheel? This is just one of our main rules. So anytime anything happened with the boys, with a friend or at school or with a teacher or whatever, our rule was always, you have to try to fix it on your own three times. And I don't mean talk to the same person three times. That's one time. Three different ways before we will pick up a phone or go into the school or have the conversation for you. You can do this. Now, that doesn't mean you have to try three things, come back when you have. That means talking about what those three things are gonna be. So maybe some of their ideas, you're thinking that's probably not a good number one. Let's talk about someone that we think could really help you in this situation. So you want to be nurturing behind the scenes, but really insisting, especially in middle school and high school, that they are the ones having the conversation. They are the ones sending the email to the teacher or to the principal or to the coach or to the whoever. Um, it's not easy for any kids to do. I think it's especially hard for our girls to do, and it's, that makes it hard for us to watch 
happen when they're shaking and they're worried and what am I going to say? So you social script and you practice and pretend I'm the principal and let's write this down and let's plan this out and who are you going to go to? I've never had to really go in and I say bust open the saloon doors and come in with my guns blazing because she's always been able to handle it on her on her own. If it's something big, I do sneak around like a sneaky mom and let someone know she's coming. I don't have the conversation, but there have been times where I picked up the phone or emailed a principal and said, Abby's going to come to you today. She's upset about something. She's trying to work through it and she'd like to talk to you about it. Just to give them a heads up that this, you know, I don't know about your girls, but if Abby had a chance to go talk to a principal every single day, she would do it. So it, it kind of, you know, sometimes it was like, oh, okay, here comes Abby again. She wants to have a conversation. But if it's something big, give them a heads up. This is, you know, something's happened on the bus. You can even give them a heads up for what it is, but ask them to please allow her to tell the story and process it with her because you're, and say it out loud, I'm trying to empower her to solve her own problems. Teachers love that. They don't want to get, they do not want to get an email from a parent, especially in high school. They want to get the email from the, from the student. So you can touch base behind the scenes if you need to. You can ask her to CC you if she's emailing somebody. Um, and again, I avoid parent-to-parent -parent confrontations like the plague because as much as it is my job to be in Abby's corner, it is that biggest bully in the school, it's that kid's parent's job to be in his corner. Even if they don't agree with what he's doing, when parents tend to go at other parents and say, your son is making my daughter's life miserable at school, their only instinct, I mean, this is their child, is to get defensive. So I try um, to go to a more you know, let's find a moderator, let's find a counselor, let's, let's get some interaction going at school. To be honest, I want to hear the results of that, but sometimes I don't need to be there because if I get emotional, then that's not going to help Abby be able to process that, that situation. You want to be proactive. If you think that anything is up, I, it doesn't matter how small, you want to send a really quick note or mention it if you see somebody early. Because again, if you think something is developing, the best time to address it is early. You don't want to wait until it has taken on its own life and now we're, you know, it's a beast. Even if it's just a hunch. It's just like supports. I say, if you, if you have it and don't need it, no harm, no foul. But if you need it and don't have it, that's a problem. So if she's having an issue and you think things are starting to spiral, you want to let everybody that, that works with her on a daily basis know that so they can kind of be more in tune to it. I mean, we've got, we've got classes in the high school that have 32 kids in a classroom. So that teacher, and she has maybe five classes of 32 in a classroom. That teacher cannot humanly be expected to be so in tune with every single one of those kids, you know, little, you know, little signs and everything. So you need to give them a heads up. And if you do, they'll be watching. Maybe they'll move her closer to the point of instruction. Maybe they'll just kind of like give her an extra pat on the back silently as they walk by and she's, she's taking notes. But if you let them know to keep their eyes open, they're happy to do it. And they want to know before it turns into a mess. Nobody likes to be surprised. I, and I say at the end of the year, parents, the, the last thing a parent wants to hear from a teacher is, this has been a problem all year. And you're thinking, great, thanks for letting me know. They feel the same way. Teachers do not like to hear from a parent in June that they've been disappointed and had trouble all year long. If you're having trouble, let them know. You want to do periodic checkpoints even if everything is going well. So this might be once a month if everything is going great. It might be once a week if everything isn't going great. You want to make it short, just checking in, things seem good on my end, you know, I just want to make sure everything's okay. If there is a tool or an app or 
uh, you know, a website or a Google Classroom, use it, download it, get the classroom code, do it. Because online grade books and assignments are fantastic ways to keep up with what's going on at school without necessarily having to, you know, drill your daughter every single day, like, let me see your plan book and let me see your assignments and where's the handout. So many schools and teachers now, I know in Worthington we're like a, you know, we're a Google, a, a Google district now, so everything's on Google Classroom. You can start, if you want to start a dialogue with, with a team of teachers, start a Google Doc. Invite them all. They can, you know, that's a, that's a collaborative document. You can be asking for comments and they'll get a notification when you add them as a, as a player in that. You want to include in middle school and high school, if you're sending an email that is to a, a classroom teacher, clearly you don't want to send a math teacher an email specific to math and you want you don't want to copy social studies science art you know you don't want those the, you don't need to have those people in that conversation so your p key point of contact is going to be your counselor so you want to copy you want to cc your counselor on every communication you have if, if you're having questions or if if your daughter is struggling in a specific content area and then later on if you have that if an issue with another teacher your counselor is thinking all right, maybe it's time for us to get this team together because now I've seen an email to the math teacher and now here's an email to the science teacher, so maybe we need to start talking here. So copy your counselor on all of that communication. They wanna, they're, they're kind of the case managers. Or if, if your daughter's on an IEP, an, an intervention specialist, always keep them in the loop. You wanna recognize the positives with the school. This will um, pay off. They hear more negative than positive, even though we all know that there's way more positive things happening in school than negative. It seems like people are less apt to make an effort to pick up a phone or write an email if everything's going great. You know, not, you, rarely do teachers get emails like, thanks for doing a great job, everything was great today. You know, I mean, it's usually when there's something wrong. So, I'm, you know, be intentional about it. Make sure that you are thanking them for something, even if it's just your daughter comes home, she had a great day, you don't even know why. You know, I don't know if you're me and you're old and you're tired, you don't even care why. <laughs> she had a great day, we're gonna celebrate that. So, you know, what, oh, what was so great about today? Oh my God, math class was great. Oh, that was a bad example, math class is never great. But anyway, math class was great. <laughs> you send that math teacher uh, an email and say, I don't know what happened, I don't know what you did in class today, but thank you. My daughter was thrilled when she got home and it's so nice to see her happy and positive. They want to hear that and it does foster mutual respect. They, they'll be more open with you. You want to be open to adjustments for sure. Remember that middle school and high school, no matter how prepared you think you are in the summer, you know, who's prepared for middle school <laughs> ever? But you want to be, remember that this is a work in progress, that this is totally uncharted for her, and the things that you might predict that are gonna be problems for her, maybe she has just mastered those, and the things that you didn't even know you didn't know about, and those are the big, you know, weeds in the garden. You know, you have to be able to constantly be evaluating and, and adjusting. Plans may need to be changed or abandoned altogether. This is my mother, again, coming through my PowerPoint my whole life. She told me, when you find yourself in a hole, the first thing you have to do is put down the shovel. The way out of a hole is not to continue to dig. It's to change directions and climb out of that hole. So whatever you're doing, stop and go another direction because if it's not working and it hasn't been working and you've given it a lot of time and it hasn't worked for a month, you know, no scientist on the earth is gonna tell you if you do the same experiment over and over and over again, suddenly, without changing anything, you're gonna get this wonderful result. You're gonna keep getting the same result and you're gonna get in your, yourself in even deeper. Communication is absolutely the key and it's not even just what you say, it's how you say it. So you wanna set a positive tone with any school, and I say it in elementary school, make sure your first interaction with that school is positive. You don't want your first interaction with that school to be sitting at an IEP meeting, having a debate about accommodations or whether things are working or whether she qualifies anymore. You want that first interaction to be, hi, I'm Kathy Montag, I'm so excited about this school year, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Even if you, you know, if, if your schedule doesn't allow you to, 
well. And, and in most middle schools and high school, it's tougher and tougher to volunteer, which is a huge difference from elementary school when your face is there and you're there and you can kind of do things. But there will, they will find a way for you to volunteer, whether it's on a PTA or if it's an after hours thing, or God forbid they ask you to chaperone a dance. <laughs> Those are terrible in middle school. <laughs> terrible for the parents, they're great for the kids. Um, you wanna make sure that if it's a bake sale, you're sending something. You know, make sure that there's a positive interaction as your first interaction. This will foster open dialogue. And that's what you want. The most meaningful information and feedback you're going to get from your child's school is going to be off the record, open, candid dialogue. So if they feel like they have to be on guard and watch every single word they say, you're just, the, the flow of information is just not going to be as good as it would be if, if you, you really do live mutual respect. You wanna demonstrate good faith and trust. These people did not walk off the street with no degree and decide, I think I'll try to teach today. They went through school. They had to get certified. There's a lot of, of stuff they had to do that's, that's hard, quite frankly. And so you have to at least recognize that they, they've been trained and you should trust what they say, even if maybe it's not quite sounding right at first. Give them a, give them a chance at least. You want to share Turner Center information, and this is tricky for us parents because nobody knows what Turner Center is when you go into a school. They may or may not have ever even have another Turner's girl ever in their career. So you want to go in because it is a very murky, you know, set of circumstances with Turner Syndrome, and let them give them all the information you have. What I tend to do is print off everything, go in with a stack. Don't expect anybody to read it, every single word, because that's not gonna happen. So you go through it and you highlight what's pertinent to your daughter. You take those little post-it flags and you just flag little things and, and you tell them if you have any questions, the answer might be in here, or just call me and let me know, but I just wanna make sure that you had a resource because you know I, I realize that this isn't something that everybody learns about in college. So you wanna pile on the resources, but you wanna make sure that you're giving them quick, easy references. Respect the expertise of your team, even if you disagree. You wanna acknowledge at the very least, and I have been in IEP meetings where believe me, there is not one thing that went right, but at the end of that meeting, at the very, very least, you need to find something to thank the team for, shake a hand, Thank you for your time. I know this didn't go well. And I know it wasn't what I expected and I realized it wasn't what you expected either. Listen, there's no parent that ever walks out of an IEP meeting feeling like the thing was a major mess where teachers are walking out thinking, oh, that went great. Everybody knows it was a mess. Everybody knows it didn't go the way anybody was expecting. So you don't have to take that personally. And sometimes just acknowledging that verbally saying, I realize that this did not go the way anybody expected. So I just, I appreciate your time. Let's keep the dialogue open. You've given me a lot to think about. I hope I've given you a lot to think about. Let's come back together and have this conversation later. You don't have to agree to be pleasant or cooperative. You can, you can disagree in a nice, positive way. Always think, of, tell them they, you like your shoes. If they can't, you know, if you can't think anything else, those are great shoes, you know, something. You wanna always be diplomatic, focus on facts, not emotion. I kinda of told this story yesterday, this 24 hour rule is, is a Sean Montag rule, that's my husband. He was a director of a, of a youth soccer league. So you can imagine the emails that he received and phone calls he got from the sidelines of games. So he's always had this 24 hour rule with his coaches and the parents and it's a really good rule to impose on yourself. And probably the most upset I've ever been with anybody who has dealt with Abby happened during a cross country practice or I guess it was a track practice in middle school. Anyway, she, she ran off with the wrong group. Nobody noticed, no adult was running with them. You know, she got completely lost, 
luckily, she found her way into the high school, even though she was in the middle school. She was able to get to a phone, call me. Anyway, I was hot. When I called the coach to let them know that I had her and practice wasn't over yet, they didn't even know she was gone. They had no idea. And you know, I don't know about if you, any of you have runners, but when they're running down by a river or you know, anywhere else, it was, a, it was clearly a safety issue. Now, number one thing was, I didn't let Abby know I was as upset with the adults as I was. I let her know her part in it. You are responsible to run with the girls. <laughs> you can't take off with the top boy group like she did and expect to not be alone and lost, because you will be. So she had her accountability in it. You know, we made a deal with her. This is, this is what we're gonna do differently next time. And if you're not comfortable running with the girls, then you have to have a conversation with the coach. Then we need to fix that problem, not just go rogue and run wherever you wanna run. I was, I was upset enough, that, and I am always try to plaster on a smile, and like I said, thank you for your time. Coach met me at the parking lot with her. I said, she's coming back to practice. I want her to finish out the practice. I want her to finish with the team meeting, and then we'll, we'll just, we'll hash all this out later. She knows that she made a bad mistake, that she made a bad choice at the beginning of this, but we probably need to talk about this later but not now, because I wouldn't have said nice words at that point, and I knew that about myself. <laughs> so I get home, and a chick, 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 I fire up this email, and I always run it by Sean, and he just was like, no, 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 no. You cannot send that email. You sound like a crazy person. You take out all the feeling words. You, you put in a timeline of what happened, step one, step two, you make statements like, I just want everybody to be on the same page. This is what happened. And I think we need to talk about you know, ways for this to avoid this in the future. 24, probably plus hours later, and about 16 edits later to where it's just now, it's just bullet points, I send the email to the coach. I CC, never blind CC anybody. I CC the athletic director and I CC the principal. And probably, I mean, it was seconds later. I don't even know if it was a minute later. My phone rings at work, and it's the athletic director. And he says, I just got your email. I can't believe you're not more upset about this. <laughs> I said, don't let my dry email fool you into thinking I'm not upset about this. But at the point, my emotions are not what's, at, what's in, in dispute here. We've got to figure out a process for her. I was off the hook. He was upset for me. I was able, I mean, the, the coach got the email that I sent. I wasn't accusing anybody of anything. I wasn't saying bad words like my first draft had said. But the athletic director, because he's a reasonable person, looked at the same set of circumstances that I was upset about, and he was upset too. Off the hook, you have a, a non-partial, an impartial party that's now going to that coach saying, there's a problem here, we need to talk about this. And that's when you're gonna be effective, when you let the facts speak for themselves. You wanna follow up all conversations and face-to-face -face meetings with emails. You wanna summarize them to make sure everybody's on the same page, because what you walk away with and your perceptions of who's gonna do what may not be what somebody else's perceptions are. So you don't want everybody to walk out of a meeting going, that's a great plan and thinking that everybody else is gonna do those things. You, you wanna make sure it's very clear. You, wanna, you, you want to know who has which action items and, and wh how and when they're gonna do those. You wanna leave conversations open for discussion and clarification. You wanna be transparent. Again, don't, I do not believe in blind CCing. I think they should wipe that BCC off of any email program. If you are having trouble with a teacher or coach or a club leader or whatever it is, and they don't know that you're CCing their, their supervisor, they're not going to feel a lot of trust with you any time after that point. They're going to be on guard. They're gonna watch every word they say. I usually give somebody a heads up. Even if it's a, if I'm, and I've done it, email the director of special education, I will always talk to the principal first and say, I appreciate your feedback. 
I, I, we're going to have to agree to disagree. I feel like I need to get more information from this, so I'm just going to reach out to the director of special education, but this is the letter that I'm going to send. Give her a heads up. And so even if they're, they don't want you to send the letter, at least they knew, and they won't be surprised when that person calls them up and say, I just got this email from Kathy Montag, and you know, what's going on? Nobody likes to be, so I wouldn't want to be surprised that way. So you need to be upfront, no blind CCs. Again, maintain a team approach, even if you don't agree, you all are still trying to work together. And the bottom line is you are a very important team member, but you are a team member after 3.30 in the afternoon. So you have to be able to have a working relationship with the team members that are with her during the day. Wow, I never, ever have enough time for this slide. I'm super happy about this. Okay, so I put out this Google form to people in my district, and I expected a few responses about what a, their, their idea of a good strategy would be when you're transitioning to a new educational setting. And if you, re, I, we probably won't read through every single one, but there, there are, there is a common theme here. It's communication, it's reaching out in the summer, and I think as parents we feel like we don't want to bother anybody over the summer. They want you to bother them over the summer because they don't consider it a bother, they consider it a tool. They want to develop a relationship with your daughter. Take them to the school over and over and over again. I, I, I work at a high school. Our high school all summer long is full of kids walking their schedule and walking the halls and trying their locker out. Be enthusiastic. Look at all these responses I got from every, every level. Positive attitudes, build quality relationships with the school staff, they want you. Talk about things that have, you know, have been transitions for you and ways you've coped with them and kind of give her some strategies. Um, a big one, Scott Dorn is this brilliant athletic director um, and, he, and his is amazing and, and the cross country coach that Abby runs for is on here too. If there is an activity in the summer that you can involve your daughter in, whether it's band, whether it's, you know, I don't know, in our case cross country is, is just a it's a big family, and you don't have to be the top runner, but it's an, it's an activity, it's, it's a structured social activity. If you can get her involved in something in the summer where she's meeting other kids that she's gonna be in school with, especially upperclassmen, that first day of school for our cross country team those freshmen walk through those halls with all the confidence in the world because they've got sophomores, juniors, and seniors all over the school going, hey, Abby, how's your day going? Are you finding everything okay? I mean, it's a built-in support system with other students. Get them involved over the summer. They all say the same thing. Do a dress rehearsal for the first day. Have, a, have some pictures if you have to, or describe what that's gonna be like. Be positive about the move. <laughs> this is Abby's math teacher. Help me help you. Like Jerry Maguire, the more I know up front, the better I can, I can deal with things. These professionals want the information that you may feel like you're bogging them down with. So don't feel like that. Again, if you're handing off a ton of information, flag it. Give them quick references. Tell them if anything seems odd, that's the Turner Syndrome way. It probably is. If you think something is off, but you think, maybe I'll give it a week or whatever, don't give it a week, just call me. I may say it's nothing, and I may say that could be a sign of something, even health-wise, that, that I need to be concerned about or check out. Keep talking. Have conversations with them and with the teachers. You want to make sure that they know they're capable of anything because they are. Parents to be comfortable with the school staff, and I would say that in middle school and high school that's hard because there's a lot of them. And there's a lot of parents, so you want to make sure that you're having some face-to-face -face conversations with them. I mean, they just, they, I was just flooded with responses for this. So, you know, for what it's worth, 
they really, this is my favorite one. This was Abby's science teacher. Whenever she would be going 90 miles an hour and seemed like a mini tornado, this strategy worked best for me. And chances are the things that drive you crazy at home and the things that, you know, like I said, they're funny till noon and then it's just exhausting. You at least have to give the staff that, that freedom too. That some of the things they do are not always going to be, you know, able to be handled without a little bit of frustration. So, you know, when you've got a student who's running around a room, you know, that can be frustrating. And so sometimes if you acknowledge that, I realize that she can be really difficult and I so appreciate you working with her and working with me and everything that you do. I know it's hard. That will build bridges like you wouldn't believe. Um, over and over and over. These are all in the, in the PowerPoint that will be, this is our cross country code, just talking about, you know, get them involved in the summer. Anyway, this is a little slideshow that I probably won't show you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? I don't, I haven't looked yet, but do you know if the website, the DFS website has an updated version of the um, the health and wellness packet for educational, Sean and I talked about that yesterday. I don't think it's updated yet, but we are talking about it. Um, so I'm, she's going to post a lot of these types of things. Um, I think I mentioned yesterday that I've put together a Google Sheet that has procedural safeguards for every single state, and it's a link to those. So I've asked her to post those as well, but if you're interested in those, leave me your email and I'll, I'll just share that Google Sheet with you. But um, I've got some websites, U.S. Department of Education, that kind of stuff, and those those state-by-state -state procedural safeguards are a really good reference, and so those, those are definitely going on the website. But I don't think it's yet, because Sean, not only is she managing the whole conference, but she's also in charge of that piece. So I, I would, I'm probably, we'll probably give her a week or two <laughs> before she has to jump into that. Yes. Right. Sure. Right. It's hard. And, and one of the things we talked about yesterday, especially with like accommodations and modifications in the classroom and things like that, Sean asked me to kind of summarize some of the things that, that we've done and, and the accommodations that we've had for Abby on a on those TS talking points, you know, those, those brochures that they're, they're gonna be able to download. So they are really actively trying to come up with, like, just like they talked about yesterday, those kind of, here's the jumping off point. These are, it's a very slim down version or outline version of things that you can do and try, but we, but we are working on getting those together. Yeah. Oh. It's exhausting. <laughs> yeah. What's cute when you're five is not so cute in fifth grade or eighth grade. Sure. Yeah. I think middle school is hard, and, and we know that our daughters are a, a, a few, you know, I mean, in my case, I always said Abby was a, a couple years behind developmentally and maturity-wise from her peers. So middle school is hard, especially because it's really, in most cases, only two years. Um, my personal experience has been that when I have been worried about, oh, that must be so hard for her, God, that hurt, must hurt her feelings, I was really putting how I would feel onto her. And when I really had conversations with her and, and got down to it and listened to what she was saying, she really didn't care. So that's one thing that is, is very difficult to do as a parent. You, you, you've, 
you know, you're having this child and you have all these expectations of how everything is going to go and then it just goes a completely different direction and sometimes that's really hard to let go of. It's also very liberating when you do let go of it. So, you know, you try to encourage some friendships. Um, my guess is most of them aren't going to have these big groups of 20, you know, that go to dances all together. Abby does have this little boyfriend. He happens to be on the autism spectrum, so they get each other. They're very age appropriate. She's, we feel lucky because he's a nice kid. It's a great friendship. Um, but getting them into activities where it's a structured social situation helps because she may not have close, like my best friend and we're always together the way you or I would have had in middle school and high school. But she can still have meaningful relationships and friendships at school where people are supportive and they help her and they understand that sometimes you know things are hard and they're there for her emotionally. So I would say getting them involved in social groups, really talk to the counselor. School counselors are excellent resources. And they might be able to get together a little social group that doesn't necessarily seem like a social group. You know, it's a, a group of kids that sit together at lunch or a group of kids that meet every so often to talk about teenage issues or whatever it is. But it is, it's hard. It's hard to, to put yourself in her body and her brain because we're not built the way she is. But what I have found with Abby is that she is totally confident in who she is. And, and again, we kind of were able to stumble through those boys before she came along and they're much older than she is. So it was a lot easier for my husband and I to look at her and say, suck it up. Because that's really the boy way of parenting, right? It's like, come on. Really, this is what we're going to get all worried about. So I try to sort of minimize that drama a lot and think, is this going to matter in 10 years? Probably not. I feel like when I was in high school, I felt like I had really, really great friends and we were going to be together forever. And, you know, I, I'm hard pressed to remember names, uh, you know, beyond a few people that were really impactful and that we stayed in touch with. So trying to foster a few good relationships. Even if they're not every weekend going out, I know that for dances for Abby, she couldn't stand them. Recess, hated it. And a lot of adults tend to say, but she's missing all the fun. Well, it's not fun for her. She's really not missing any fun because it's not fun for her. It's more like poking your eyeballs out with an ice pick, to be honest with you. And the sensory and the, and the chaos and the unknowns in a middle school dance are terrible. The dance last night, I don't know how many of your daughters go to the dance last night, they don't last long there. It's dark, it's loud, there's lights, there's music. So kind of give her the freedom to not enjoy some of those social things. And if she doesn't, if she's not embracing a lot of social situations, then you just let her know you are going to be required to participate in one activity each semester, and you can choose what that is. Maybe that's anime club, maybe that's cross country, maybe that's you know volleyball, maybe that's soccer, whatever it is where her interests are, but require that, you know, and, and they won't always love you for it. <laughs> They'll always love you, but they won't always like you for it. Um, and, and you'd be surprised at how far that can go. So she's, you know, she's, she's not, a, she went to prom this year with her boyfriend. They didn't go in a big group of 30. And again, as a parent, if we're all being honest, it's really hard. Facebook is hard because everybody's posting all these pictures and look at all this great stuff going on. Well, I can tell you that working in a high school and having relationships with typically developing girls, I mean, and boys, but especially girls, it is not all fun like it looks on Facebook. You know, a lot of these kids are going through issues and, and they're not as open to talk about it. And so in some ways I think that, you know, when, it, when a, a student, especially a girl, learns early to let those things roll off and not get hung up in that little, you know, dramatic world, they're so much happier. And all of her teachers have said she seems so much more mature. To me, she seems, again, a couple years behind. 
But once they get into high school, not everybody in their class is going to be in their grade. Not everybody, in, you know, you've got 14 year olds and 18 year olds hanging out together. So that kind of developmental discrepancy, it, it kind of fades a little bit because there's younger kids and older kids and, and high school kids are really just sort of, you know, in our, you know they're, they're just, they're hanging out all together all the time. So that maturity becomes less of an issue, I think, in high school because they have the ability to hang out with younger kids too that are more on their same, you know, kind of level developmentally. I don't know if that helps or not. I had to let a lot go. Yeah. You know.